Well, thank you, Suzanne, and it's, it's a good morning to everybody. It's a really a great pleasure to be here, and thank you to the Stockholm School of Economics for hosting the event, uh, to the European Union for supporting the uh, event, and to UNDP for inviting me to give the Reichard Kapuczynski lecture. Actually, one, one of the, I, I know Reichard Kapuczynski's reputation has taken a few hits over the past year or two. But for me, one of the things that really stands out about his work is his unbelievable talent for escaping his press minders and going off the beaten track in the African countries that he was writing from, and his empathy for the lives of ordinary people, which he captured so dramatically in his journalistic writings, but also in his, uh, in his other writing. And actually, that, that issue of um, heading off the beaten track and talking about people whose lives we often forget is really at the heart of what I want to talk about today in this uh, lecture on inequality and human development. So the theme of inequality is an issue that's been around an awful long time. Uh, Plato used to worry about the level of inequality in Greek city-states. Uh, in, in fact, he reputedly argued that no citizen should have a level of wealth more than five times the level of wealth of the poorest person in a city-state. So you have to wonder what Plato would make of the world today. And even Elizabethan England actually had its advocates for redistribution. There's a wonderful line in King Lear where he says, distribution should undo excess and each man have enough. Now, in a way, that's a pretty good millennium development goal, actually. And I know it would take uh, probably a couple of dozen UN conferences to define exactly what we mean by the word enough. But the principle that there is a limit to levels of inequality that are acceptable is one of very long-standing tradition. And today, inequality is back on the international agenda and, and many national agendas in a really big way. I think in a way that it hasn't been on the agenda for the past couple of decades. I live in the United States at the moment, and if you think back to the last US presidential election, the issue of wealth distribution in the US was right at the heart of some of the biggest debates that, that were going on. If you listen to African political leaders, you know, this is a region that's now growing very strongly, but African political leaders are increasingly concerned about the distribution of growth. In China, in India, in much of Latin America, governments increasingly recognize that we have patterns of growth and opportunity that are leaving too many people behind. And of course, the issue of inequality is right at the heart of what defines many social movements around the world, you know, whether you talk about the Wall Street social movements or, or women's movements in Africa, uh, protest movements in India. These are movements that are concerned with inequality and opportunity. There, there are two fundamental reasons why I see inequality really as the defining human development issue of our age. And one of those reasons is about the intrinsic value of equity. We can endlessly debate what are the acceptable limits of inequality in any society, and I'm sure we will debate it after. But what I would submit is beyond reasonable dispute is that we live in a world in which the world as a whole and many countries have levels of inequality that are beyond the limits of acceptability. We live in a world where what people are able to achieve is determined not by their efforts, not by their native talents, and not by their potential, but by which country they happen to be born in, by whether or not their parents happen to be rich or poor, by whether their skin color is black or white, by the language they happen to speak, by their gender, whether they happen to be a boy or a girl. Now, these are circumstances which any proponent 
of universal values would say should not be determining what a person is able to achieve. And, and I think the case for equity is about breaking down the force of these circumstances as a constraint on potential. Now, you, you would have thought that inequality would be right at the center of debates about the post-2015 Millennium Development Goals. And it is true that equity has figured at the margins in that debate, but it hasn't been at the center. There's a sort of undercurrent, which I, I think isn't really articulated clearly, but the undercurrent is basically that the Millennium Development Goals are about tackling absolute deprivation, about eliminating absolute poverty, about reducing child deaths, about getting all children into school. And if we're pursuing absolute goals, why does the relative distribution matter? Actually, Tony Blair captured that argument pretty well back in 2000, when he was challenged on his approach to poverty in Britain. And a journalist said to him, aren't you concerned about rising inequality in the country? And his response was something like, I don't get out of bed in the morning and think about how I can make David Beckham poorer in order to make this a better country. Uh, I think what he was trying to say was if you care about poverty and improving the absolute condition of poor people, it doesn't really matter what's going on at the top end of the scale. Now you can debate that, but what I think you can't debate and where Tony Blair was wrong is it, it may not, uh, whether or not he was right about Be David Beckham, he should have been more concerned about ensuring that people at the bottom end of the distribution achieve an incrementally bigger part of the growth cake than people at the top, and that there's a stronger focus on, on the role of government in redistributing opportunity to people who are marginalized. And I want to make the case today for really putting redistribution and equity right at the core of the MDG agenda, actually in the way that the EU outlined earlier. Um, now hopefully this is going to work. Let, let me say something first of all about, I, I want to start with a bird's eye view of what's going on in global income distribution and make the case for why income distribution matters as a central part of the poverty reduction agenda and then look beyond income to some wider aspects of human development. So let, let's just take a bird eye view of what's going on with distribution under globalization. There are two big themes, I think, in globalization. One of them is convergence, and the other is divergence. The convergence is what is going on as a result of more rapid growth in emerging markets and the poorest countries. This gives you a trend line for per capita income in the richest countries. This gives you trend lines for developing regions. And you can see China catching up. You can see at the right-hand end of the scale other regions catching up. It's important to say they're catching up from an incredibly low base, and we still live in a very divided world. Just how divided is illustrated by this data, which shows you the distribution of income worldwide across different deciles, from the poorest 10% up to the richest 10%. If you take the poorest 40%, uh, both back in 1990 and in 2010, they account for just around 5% of world income. And despite the convergence, that picture has really hardly changed over the last two decades. If you go to the other end of the scale, the richest 10%, account for 54% of world income. The, th the third column um, on the right hand of the distribution is the income shares in South Africa, which is the world's most unequal country. In other words, as a global community, we are more unequal than the most unequal country in the world. So wh why do we have this persistently high level of inequality in the midst of the convergence that I described earlier.
the reason for that is the second part of the globalization story, which is divergence. That is the growth of income inequality within countries. It's that, that is true, this is, the, this is using the Gini coefficient, which I guess we're in a group of economists, people will know what the Gini coefficient is. Um, this is the global Gini coefficient, but this is what is going on in different parts of the world. Rising inequality in China, rising inequality in urban India, rising inequality in Indonesia, um, modest rises in inequality in an already very unequal country like Ghana, rising inequality in Tanzania, in Zambia. Now there are exceptions to the rule, and one of them is Brazil, where inequality is starting to fall, and another is Vietnam, which is a country which does have inequalities, of course, but uh, at a national scale, it's sustained high growth with relatively modest levels of inequality. Um, I, I should add one caveat in this, which is that the Gini coefficient, the, the surveys that the Gini coefficient is based on, are pretty good at capturing what's going on at the bottom end of the distribution with the poorest people, but it's not so good at capturing what's going on at the top end of the distribution with the richest people. Rich people, by and large, don't participate in these surveys. And if you take a country like India, um, India has one of the world's highest growth rates. It also has the world's fastest growing number of billionaires. Uh, there were two billionaires in India in the mid-1990s. There are now 47. Um, if you take their collective wealth, it represents something like 12% of Indian GDP. So we've seen this extraordinary phenomenon of people right at the top end of the distribution pulling further and further away. This is actually what the debate about the 0.1% of the 1% in the United States is about. Um, as well. So what has any of this got to do with poverty reduction? Um, this is a David, back to the David Beckham argument. Well, the, the answer is that if you compare a country, if you compare countries like India and Brazil, a couple of things stand out. In Brazil has been growing much less rapidly than India, but it's been reducing poverty much more rapidly. Every percentage point of growth in Brazil cuts poverty at something like five times the rate that you get in a country like India. And the reason for that is that if you look at the distribution of growth in India, the, the incidence of growth across different parts of the population, this is for urban India, but you can see at the left-hand scale of the distribution, the, the, the poorest parts of the country, deciles one to four, their income has been growing much less rapidly than the average income, whereas incomes from the middle upwards have been growing more rapidly. If you compare that with Brazil, it's exactly the mirror image that incomes on the poorest parts of society have been growing more rapidly than incomes at the top part. And this helps to explain the not so mysterious outcome that Brazil has, has made dramatic progress in cutting malnutrition. It's made dramatic progress in cutting poverty, whereas India has a pretty derisory record given its growth achievements um, on both counts. And the policies behind that in Brazil include, of course, the social protection programs that they put in place, but it also includes programs like increased support for education and health in the poorest areas, labor market legislation on minimum wages, and other interventions which are deliberately redistributive. Economists always used to tell us there was a trade-off between growth and distribution. Uh, that trade-off is illusory, and, and Brazil demonstrates that. You can have high growth, with positive distribution, and it would be good for the Millennium Development Goals. I want to take that argument to a global scale and link it back to the post-2015 MDG 
debate. My colleague in the Brookings Institution, Lawrence Chandy and his team, have been doing work developing a data set that looks at where we're going as a global community on poverty reduction. And as you might know, one of the likely goals for the post-2015 period will be the eradication of extreme poverty by 2030. And what the work of Lawrence and his team demonstrates is that on current trends, if you take the baseline scenario, we're not going to achieve that target. We're going to fall some 400 million short of the eradication of absolute poverty um, by 2030. But their baseline is very sensitive to distribution. If you were to keep the growth projection constant, but redistribute on an incremental annual basis 0.25% of income from the poorest 10% down, sorry, from the richest 10% down to the poorest 40%, it would have the effect of lifting an additional 154 million people out of poverty by 2025. Now, when you bear in mind those distribution patterns that I outlined earlier, the richest 10% with 54% of income, the poorest 40% with 5% of income, we're not exactly talking about revolutionary shifts in income distribution here, but we're talking about a pattern of growth with equity that would get us towards the goal of eradicating absolute poverty by 2015. And if a country like India were to adopt that goal, we could see the eradication of poverty by 2030, but you certainly won't see it, as, as this graph demonstrates, without a distributive shift in favor of the poor. Now, I, I've been talking so far about income poverty, monetary poverty, and that is one critical dimension of the disparities in human development that, that really matter, because these income disparities define, in many cases, the life chances of poor people. But of course, the disparities that we should be concerned about go way beyond income. And I want to talk a little bit about education and health. Um, the, this um, line it, it basically tells you what happens in a country like Sweden. A child entering the school system in Sweden today has something like a 70% probability of getting through to tertiary level education. That is their life chance in education, if, if you like. Th this is what the life chance curve looks like for a child in sub-Saharan Africa. You have a 4% chance of getting through to tertiary education. If you happen to be a girl, you have a 2% chance of getting through to tertiary education. This is a really stark example of what I mean by circumstances and where you're born determining what you're in a position to achieve in life. These are the um, life chance curves for different parts of the world. Now, this, this really matters for all sorts of reasons. It matters intrinsically because we should care about the destruction of human potential that is implicit in that number of just 4% of children having a chance to get through to tertiary education. But we also live in an increasingly knowledge-based global economy. And these disparities in education that you see today are tomorrow's disparities in opportunities for trade, for growth, for employment, for progress in health, um, and in other dimensions. So if you care about the future pattern of globalization, we should care about this pattern of inequality. Again, that was a bird's eye view of what's going on at a global level. But to really understand the disparities or to really understand the forces that are holding back the progress of nations in education, you need to look beneath the national level to the underlying structure of opportunity and disadvantage. And I want to illustrate this by reference to one country, which is Nigeria. Um, if you take Nigeria, th this line, and I'm sorry the number has dropped off of the line, but it's basically a line that charts years 
in school. And in Nigeria, the average Nigerian child gets, uh, sorry, the, the average Nigerian aged 17 to 22 has received just over six years of education. That's the average position. If you look beneath the average to rich and poor, poor Nigerians get something like three and a half years in school. So being poor, born into a poor family automatically wipes out your chances of three years of education against the national average. If you're born um, as a poor rural person, there's a further shrinkage of opportunity. And if you're born as a poor rural girl, the probability shrinks even further to the point where if you're a poor rural girl in northern Nigeria, your average years of schooling is under one, less than one year in school for no better reason than you happen to have been born into a poor family and you live in a particular part of the country. Th this is a graphic which I'd really recommend you to go and look at. It's from the UNESCO Global Monitoring Report, World Inequality in Education Database. There are many other examples. Uh, I'm going to skip this one on, on Pakistan f um, for time reasons. But understanding those underlying structures of inequality in education really matter if we're serious about achieving goals like universal primary education or universal secondary education. Because if you look at who's being left behind, you know, this is not a random distribution. These are completely predictable outcomes. In a country like Sweden, you have your own inequalities, I know, but it's very difficult to predict with a, sweet, with a Swedish child born into a particular household in a particular part of Sweden, where that child will end up in the national income distribution, whether that child will be a doctor or a lorry driver. The, you know, these are things that are hard to predict in a country like Sweden because you have high levels of social mobility. In a country like Nigeria or Pakistan, if you're born as a poor rural girl, all bets are off there's a 90% pr plus probability that you won't even get through secondary school, let alone beyond that. Now, it follows from that, if we're serious about achieving that absolute goal of universal primary education, we have to focus on kids who are being left behind, the 15 million children who are out of school because they're child laborers. You know, the girls who are denied opportunities because of the gender biases that they face in the school system and beyond the school system. Kids who are disabled, they need to be the, fo they need to be the focal point of policies. And what the post 2015 Millennium Development Goal debate should be doing is turning the spotlight on those disparities. It's the same in an area like health. If you think about an issue like child mortality. This just takes a group of countries, that's the average, uh, I'm sorry, the average infant mortality rate, deaths per 1,000 live, live births. That's the infant mortality rate if you're born into the richest 10%. That's the infant mortality rate if you're born into the poorest 10%. That's a reflection of restricted access to basic services, of the poverty that these people uh, are living in and other disadvantages. So let me bring this back to the post-2015 dialogue. You could argue that um, it doesn't really matter that much. I mean, in the last analysis, who really cares if a high-level dialogue conducted under UN auspices produces a bunch of targets that governments of the, around the world sign up for and then go back home and ignore. And that is a risk. But if you look at what's been achieved under the 2015 goals, one of the things those goals did was to provide a focal point for a concerted international effort to achieve shared objectives. 
It put poverty in the spotlight in a way that those of us who were working on international development back in the 1990s or even the 1980s wouldn't have imagined possible. So they made a difference. And they made a difference because they signaled an intent. They turned the spotlight on something that matters. And that's what the post-2015 goals can do. They can turn a spotlight on the policies that keep un disadvantaged children where they are. They can, learn, they can turn a spotlight on the policies that guarantee we will not achieve the goal of eradicating poverty by 2030 because of failures to tackle inequality. Policies like public spending in a country like Pakistan, where the vested interests at the top of the income distribution are so concerned to prioritize their interests, particularly their interest in not paying tax, that the country is unable to afford a basic education system or a basic health system that can meet the needs of its most vulnerable people. Policies like those in Angola, which are designed to obscure the operations of state companies in the oil sector in order to facilitate the accumulation of private wealth by the richest people in the country while, of, while diminishing the public resources available to tackle the needs of the poorest people in the country. Uh, you may be interested to know that the first female African entrant, entrant to the Forbes list of billionaires in the world was Isabel dos Santos. Um, and in case, you you, in case you don't recognize the name, that is the daughter of the president of Angola. And I think we can safely say that some of the startup capital would certainly have come from oil wealth stolen from the people of Angola who don't have clean water, who don't have schools, who don't have decent homes to live in. We're talking about policies like those in Kenya, where the vast majority of children who are out of school are living in the arid northern and northeastern areas, but where public spending priorities focus resources on the most advantaged areas of the country. So th you know, these are policies through which um, the groups that benefit from those, that distribution of opportunity that I outlined, that distribution of income that I outlined, perpetuate their own position. You know, why build a social protection system that could lift millions of people out of poverty when you can give a tax break to the people who are funding your re-election campaign? Uh, I believe that the framers of the post-2015 Millennium Development Goals have a responsibility to stand up for the interests of people lacking a political voice. To have a, they have a responsibility to align themselves with the social movements, with civil society, with the agencies that are trying to achieve change and put these things on the map. None of that is intended to downplay the importance of absolute goals. And we should set a very high level of ambition. We should be aiming to achieve the eradication of poverty by 2030, not just at $1.25 a day, but at $2 a day. We should be aiming to get every child into school, not just into primary school, but through secondary school. We should be aiming not just to eliminate unnecessary child deaths, but to eliminate the malnutrition that blights the lives and the potential of so many children. But if we're going to achieve those goals, we need to get serious about those inequalities. And I believe that if the timeline for achieving the next set of MDGs is 2030, we need some, what I would describe as stepping stone targets. These are interim equity-based goals that could be achieved by 2020 or 2025 that will, you know, the, the 2030 point is our destination. But these equity-based goals will be the roadmap for getting us there. They would include indicative targets like limiting the ratio of the income of the richest 10% to the poorest 10%. Why not have a ceiling 
for the Gini coefficient as a target? Why not, when we look at an issue like education, say we will halve the school attendance gap between the richest and the poorest, between the best performing part of the country and the worst performing part of the country? In a place like Sweden, if you had education indicators somewhere in the north, which were one third the level that you have here in Stockholm, you would have national outrage on your hands. And we need to create a sense of outrage about what's going on to young rural girls in countries like Nigeria and Pakistan. And I think having those equity-based targets for which governments would be responsible for reporting on over time, you know, would help to turn the spotlight on something that really matters. There are, I'm aware, all sorts of technical difficulties that would have to be addressed in setting those equity-based targets. And my colleague in the Overseas Development Institute, Claire Melamed, has done some brilliant work on this, which I'd really encourage you all to go and take a look at. But I don't believe the complexity should stop us from doing what is the right thing. And the right thing is to put these issues of social justice and equity right at the heart of the Millennium Development Goal project, because ultimately this is what it's supposed to be all about. This is about the shared values, the ethical underpinning of things that we believe to be right as societies and things that we believe to be fair, and we need to come together to make it happen. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much.